Hello everyone and welcome to the first in our three-part panel discussion series on the use of alternative fuels in medium and heavy duty vehicle applications. I'm Nino Dicara, founder of Electrical Autonomy Canada, and I'm delighted to introduce the series, which is sponsored by Petro Canada. Canadians' energy needs are evolving and Petro Canada is committed to keeping people moving as we navigate the changing energy landscape. With a growing portfolio of alternative energy offers, Petro Canada is helping businesses and consumers meet their lower carbon mobility needs. In 2019, the launch of Canada's electric highway reimagined the way EV drivers could travel across the country as Canada's first coast-to-coast -coast network of ultra-fast EV chargers. Now, Petro Canada is proud to introduce an innovative new diesel product to the BC market, Petro Canada Eco Diesel. Petro Canada Eco Diesel is a drop-in renewable fuel made with hydro-treated renewable diesel that offers the same high performance as conventional diesel, while also reducing the greenhouse gas emissions by up to 84% compared to conventional diesel. To learn more about Petro Canada Eco Diesel, including some real world case studies, visit petro-canada.ca slash eco diesel, and you'll find a bunch more information there. We're grateful to Petro Canada for their support in sponsoring this series. Well, even if we hit the federal government target for 100% of medium and heavy duty trucks sold by 2040, uh, be zero emission, we still have at least two decades of combustion vehicles with heavy greenhouse gas emissions on the roads. So how can we fuel these vehicles in the best way possible? Well, in this first of three webinar sessions, we'll be discuss discussing what are the biofuel, hydrogen, and compressed natural gas vehicles available in Canada right now, who is making the alternative fuels, how clean is the supply chain, and where is the alternative fuel sector going? And especially, how will the clean fuel regulations drive this movement forward? Well, we've got some fantastic speakers lined up for you today, and if I can invite them to uh, fire up their, their cameras, and uh, I'd be pleased to uh, introduce them all to you. They are Dave Fath, General Manager, Brand Marketing at Suncor Energy and Petro Canada. Josipa Petrunovic, President and CEO at Canadian Urban Transit Research Innovation Consortium, also known as Kutrick. Aura Plumtree, Research Director at Electric Mobility Canada. Ryan Krogemeyer, Senior Vice President, Refining Supply Trading at Parkland Corporation and my colleague, Emma Jarrett, Managing Editor at Electric Autonomy Canada. Before I hand over to Emma to start the panel, I'm honoured to introduce an address by Julie de Bruson, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources and to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you and welcome everybody. I'm pleased to be here today to share some thoughts on such an important issue, the future of alternative fuels. With about 38,000 kilometers of highway weaving through 9.9 .9 million square kilometers, Canada is a massive country. And right now, there are close to 40 million vehicles driving across these highways every day, moving people, moving goods, keeping our economy humming. At the same time, they account for about 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. We simply have to change that, and we are. Every year, new advancements in alternative fuels from electric vehicles to natural gas, battery-powered cars to renewable energy are making the low-carbon energy landscape more efficient, accessible, and affordable. And that's why Electric Autonomy Canada's webinars are so important and timely. I know that all members of the transportation community have the same goal, to remain economically viable as the energy landscape adapts. The reality is, that those companies that are leaning in emissions reductions are the ones that will thrive in a new net zero economy. As scientists design new alternative fuels and engineers design the infrastructure, we need workers to run the assembly lines that manufacture these low carbon products. This government is committed to supporting these efforts. For example, Canada's clean fuel regulations will spur innovation in the clean fuel sector to unlock consumer options for alternative energy sources for transportation fuel, such as liquid biofuels and clean hydrogen. And as you know, 
Canada has set a goal of making sure that all new light-duty passenger vehicles sold in Canada are zero emission by 2035, and all medium-duty and heavy-duty vehicles by 2040. To support these efforts, we invested a historic $1 billion that includes rebates of up to $5,000 to purchase new battery electric or other zero-emitting vehicles, such as hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And our recent federal budget included an additional $1.7 billion to extend the purchase incentive program until March 2025. There was also an additional $400 million to build more of the required charging infrastructure so Canadians can have the confidence that they can charge their vehicles throughout any drive. We're building that confidence by building a national network of charging stations in places where Canadians live, work, and play. And we're making headway. In the past few years alone, Canada has supported more than 34,500 EV chargers. Earlier this summer, Prime Minister Trudeau announced a $1.5 billion investment in Canada for the development of a new Umicor electric vehicle battery plant here in Ontario. This builds off of commitments by companies such as Stellantis to build electric vehicles right here in Canada. Our government is unlocking these investments that help us achieve our ambitious climate goals while unlocking sustainable jobs for generations to come. Of course, hydrogen also has a key role to play in decarbonizing our transportation systems. That's why we've released a hydrogen strategy to make Canada a top producer of low and zero carbon hydrogen. We are leveraging our natural advantages and accelerating domestic production and use of hydrogen. And we are cementing our place as a global supplier of choice. That is why the German Chancellor recently visited us and signed a hydrogen alliance with Canada to unlock a clean hydrogen trade corridor across the Atlantic. And we're working from a strong foundation. Today, as we speak, Canadian fuel cells propel more than half of the world's hydrogen bus fleet. We already have many large-scale production projects underway, with many more to come in the next year. In fact, today, Canada is home to the most hydrogen engineers in the G20. As hydrogen refueling infrastructure is being implemented, hydrogen buses are being built, and hydrogen humps are beginning to form across the country. Moving forward, the fuels that Canadians use every day will become progressively cleaner, and more affordable alternatives will be increasingly available to consumers so that we can continue to develop a truly sustainable transportation system while responsibly developing our natural resources and continuing our legacy as a trusted supplier to the world. Through innovation and collaboration, I'm confident that together, we can build a clean energy future, strengthen our economy, and create good jobs as we journey through this transition. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Great, so that was excellent to hear from Parliamentary Secretary uh, Julie de Bruson. Uh, just before we kick off with our panelists, I'd love to remind uh, viewers that if you have any questions that you'd like to put to our panelists, to please put them in the Q&A um, area rather than the, the chat. Um, it just helps us to keep track and we'd be thrilled to ask those at the end of this. So to kick us off, uh, Dave, I would love for you to set the scene for us on um, what is available today to medium heavy duty fleet owners in terms of alternative fuel options. And, you know, from the perspective of if I woke up today as a fleet owner and I wanted to change or improve our carbon, my fleet's carbon footprint, what could I do today? And what might I be able to do in the next one to five years? Yeah, well, uh, first off, thanks for hosting the webinar and uh, and for inviting uh, and, and for the invitation to participate. You know, the great news is that there are a number of alternatives available today across Canada. Uh, until recently, alternative fuels like propane and compressed natural gas uh, would have been the only options available. And, you know, while these fuels do uh, have certain use cases for which they perform very well, um, I think consumers are looking for other alternatives. Um, and uh, one that we've seen come into the market is electrification. Uh, it's expanded into the mobile energy space primarily uh, to uh, solve needs in the um, uh, sort of light duty or, or uh, passenger uh, vehicle fleet, but it, it has also uh, presented itself for, for uses in the uh, medium and, and uh, sort of large industrial fleets as well. 
Um, and, and so I think we'll continue to see that expansion over the next year and, and over the next five years, uh, especially. Um, for heavier industrial use uh, and, and heavy transport specifically, I think there's a great potential uh, for hydro-treated renewable diesel. Uh, it's, a, it's a product um, that has a significantly lower carbon footprint than uh, traditional diesel. Um, and, uh, you, you know, uh, it performs just like regular diesel. Uh, it's not yet widely available to consumers, but we are starting to see it enter markets in Canada. Um, as, uh, as said earlier, uh, you know, we've recently launched it in British Columbia. Um, and uh, over the next five years, I think it's fair to expect that HRD products will become more widely available uh, across the country. Great. So, Ryan, um, picking up where, where Dave left off, could you describe to us some of the infrastructure needs to support a wide rollout of alternative fuels um, and maybe you know, identify some challenges that, that um, suppliers are experiencing right now? Yeah, thank, thank you, Emma. Uh, again, appreciate uh, the invitation to, uh, to be with you all today. Uh, you know, your question's a great one, but the infrastructure needed really depends on the type of alternative fuel that you're, you're talking about. Uh, let me take hydrogen first. If it's hydrogen, uh, you need to see a lot of new infrastructure get built. You know, you'll need to move the hydrogen from the source of production, which today is primarily uh, centered in industrial centers, uh, to distribution points via pipeline, most likely, and then on from those distribution points to the hydrogen fueling facilities, which will likely go uh, by truck. So as most hydrogen uh, today is produced from existing industrial facilities, new greener production sources will have to be sought out and all the infrastructure to get it to consumers built out as well. You know, this will take time and it will be quite costly. It's not easy to ship hydrogen via rail in an economic fashion. So the cost effective, quote, virtual pipeline that rail offers us here in Canada to connect producers and consumers really isn't a viable pathway. So uh, you, you, you do have limited options when it comes to hydrogen. Let me just talk about electrification real quickly. Uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna say that the, both the generation and distribution of electricity is going to need a lot of investment uh, to meet that future demand profile. And I think we all understand where that, what that infrastructure is and what needs to be upgraded. But again, large investments in both generation distribution and then ultimately in uh, getting it uh, into uh, consumers' uh, batteries. Let me talk a little bit about biofuels and the infrastructure there. You know, biofuels such as ethanol and fame based biodiesel have been with us for many years. And the infrastructure needed to source it, blend it with conventional fuels and then distribute it, uh, those blended fuels to the market it is, is pretty mature uh, and maturing even more in Canada. There are challenges with ethanol and biodiesel, however. Ethanol is uh, difficult to ship in pipelines and product quality must be managed throughout the supply chain because it's what we call hydrophilic and it's soluble in water. And uh, water in your engine uh, is a really bad thing. Uh, so it has its, its limitations. Uh, and then with biofuel, fame-based biofuel, uh, the, the infrastructure has to be heated uh, during the colder months to maintain a minimum temperature. And uh, there are what we call uh, 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 poor point and cold flow properties that limit the use of biodiesel. Now I want to talk about the most advantaged alternative fuel from a supply chain perspective. And Dave alluded to this a little bit in his comments. It's what we call renewable diesel. Uh, it's, it's what we call a drop in fuel and it doesn't require any new or special infrastructure beyond what is needed for conventional diesel uh, it doesn't need to be built out. So the infrastructure largely exists. It can be shared with renewable diesel. Uh, and this is a big advantage uh, because when we think about the overall value proposition of lower carbon intensity fuels to society 
and the consumer from a cost perspective. We have to keep all of that in mind. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a superior pathway in many respects relative to traditional biofuels. Uh, so this is partly why you see uh, disproportionately more investment in renewable uh, fuels manufacturing, both renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel than you do in ethanol or traditional biodiesel manufacturing. Thank you. And, and Bora, you have a very important policy piece for us that I definitely want to get into, but um, Yasipa, just because we, we got onto hydrogen quickly, do you have anything you want to say, uh, you know, commenting on, on Ryan and, and what Dave have said? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just in terms of the pathway, I suppose, for heavy duty, if we were to look at the pathway for electrification overall, I would say it's much further ahead than the trucking industry and much further ahead than the electric car industry and the hydrogen car industry as well. So public transit itself, maybe five, six years ago, you would have thought is the last adopter. It's actually one of the first adopters, and it's probably going to be the game changer in the country. And the reason for that is public transit buys in fleet, it buys in mass, and it's buying now and there's absolutely no discussion of buying diesel, even if it's clean diesel. So, you know, there's been a trigger point that has been hit, and part of that has been driven by not just the 2040 goals that the federal government has set out, but municipalities well over 10 years ago were declaring climate emergencies. So you had cities like Toronto, Burlington, Vancouver declaring that they would be zero emissions in their transit over five years ago. Uh, so that is just way ahead of the industry in terms of personal cars and personal or rather private trucking. With that, the infrastructure has grown. The buses are available and battery electrified platforms and hydrogen electrified platforms. The one gap is the provision of green hydrogen. That is for sure an issue that there's a lot of kind of gray and blue, out, not even a lot of blue out there, frankly, and not even a lot of gray, but there's more of it available um, than green. But nonetheless, green is also being developed right now with a lot of federal investment. And of course, in Markham, produced by Enbridge, there's green hydrogen available there for GTHA transit agencies. So I suppose I'm a, the, the piece to put out there is while we often pay attention to trucking and cars, it's actually public transit and battery electrification hydrogen that is going to change the landscape in the next five years at least. And, and that includes the infrastructure build out. And I can't underscore how important this is our, this is going to be for heavy duty trucks, including whether they're you know special cutaways or they're 18 wheelers, a lot of the infrastructure for battery electrification is going to be the J3105 high power charging system. Like these are these high pantographs that trucks pulling under. Most private fleets are not going to build their own. Not even Tesla is going to build their own across the country. But public transit is building it because it's taxpayer backed. And those pieces of infrastructure will not be 100% leveraged and used by transit 24 hours a day. So there's going to be times on the, those infrastructure pieces that are out on the road, out on a highway that's available to rent for trucking. So that is an immediate pathway opportunity. And then on the green hydrogen side, the pressure points for production and delivery are the same for buses as they are for coaches, as they are for trucks, not for cars, but definitely on the heavy duty side. And so if the pull is going to be Toronto and Brampton and Mississauga, which it is for green hydrogen, that is exactly where you can expect hydrogen trucking to take off as well, because that's where the production will be delivered. Uh, so this is, you know, these are some really interesting elements that are often forgotten because public transit's typically not treated as the driver of the transportation landscape, but in the new fuel sector, it most certainly will be. Right, and, and that dovetails us really nicely into, um, you know, Bora talking to us about another catalyst effect on this sector, which is the clean fuel standards or, or clean fuel regulations. So, you know, Bora would love to hear, um, you know, how that component is going to fit into all of this and, and how the it can be leveraged to advance alternative fuel use. Certainly. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And it's great to be on the, on a panel with my co-panelists here. I um, would love to talk to you about the clean fuel regulations. I think um, there are uh, questions uh, that have been resolved recently about this uh, new policy with respect to the timelines uh, and how effective it's going to be in terms of inducing new domestic demand for alternative fuels in the in the near and medium term. So on the timelines part, I think as a um, purportedly fuel or technology neutral policy, the clean fuel regulations are going to let all kinds of energies compete, of course, so whether it's ethanol or biodiesel or hydrogenation derived renewable diesel, RNG, CNG, hydrogen, electricity, um, as well as 
uh, lower carbon gasolines, right, including that incorporate technologies like carbon capture and storage or co-processed renewable feedstocks. So I think an important sort of thing to consider in terms of the, the timeline dynamic for new adoption um, is that market penetration and domestic demand is going to vary by the type of alternative fuel and, of course, by their relative costs. So with that caveat in mind, I think what we do know now is that the regulatory timeline, despite having re been repeatedly extended under the sort of course of the regulatory development of the CFR, um, has been you know, confirmed as sort of coming into force in 2023. That's relative, mind you, to an ambition, early policy ambition for full Im implementation of a much larger policy than what we've actually got now um, to come into force in 2019. Um, which gives you a sense of how challenging it was to actually get this um, off the off the runway. Um, but the new reality is that the main element of the CFR, which is um, this carbon intensity reduction requirement um, on what are called primary suppliers, or that's in the jargon of the regulation, these um, fossil fuel refiners import and importers like Suncor, like Parkland, um, this, the carbon intensity reduction requirements on these companies are going to come into force next July uh, in 2023. And in the meantime, uh, Environment Canada has uh, confirmed that there is a possibility between now and then um, with the regulations having been um, published in Canada's at part two earlier this summer, um, that there will be a possibility of building up a credit bank because early crediting is now in effect. So I think um, in terms of you know, assessing the effect that this policy is um, going to have and has already had um, arguably on the marketplace and alternative fuels, I think it has arguably already had some effect. We've seen, for example, the come by chance refinery get a new le lease on life uh, on the East Coast with a planned conversion to renewable diesel production. And I think they're also targeting sustainable aviation fuels. Um, with that project, uh, we've seen new canola crush facilities um, been in, be announced in, on the prairies. Um, and we've seen um, pretty major investments in the renewable diesel processing space um, as well by Federated Co-op and Imperial and at the Strathcona refinery. So there are already projects that are starting to come online that have been announced even in advance of the regulation coming into effect. Um, but in terms of that sort of medium term demand, um, or even near term demand rather from the CFR, I think there are other decisions that have been made around the policy and included provisions that have been included within it that I would argue suggest that there are going to be low prices in terms of the credits in this market that the policy will create and a possible oversupply in the early years of the policy. Um, so these are these are so-called flexibilities within the program, such as early credit banking, changes that were made to the stringency and the timing of this carbon intensity reduction trajectory between the draft and the final regulation, um, double counting of credits between the existing renewable fuel regulations, which is the federal blending mandate on renewable fuels um, during the transition from one policy to the next uh, in the CFR as the kind of the new paradigm on um, on fuel regulations federally. Um, and then there's also this issue of baseline credit volumes, which you can assume would enter into the federal system as a result of overlapping policies, um, not being static. So for example, consider that the BC government is just in the process of tabling new regulations to implement its recently passed Low Carbon Fuels Act. And all of these factors, in my judgment, kind of um, factor into an assessment that the, the early years of the CFR are unlikely to be deeply challenging for obligated parties as they work to achieve compliance. Um, but with a system this new and challenging, perhaps, that's, perhaps this is understandable. I think that um, folks need time to understand their options and become comfortable with many different parts of the, the regulatory apparatus, so to speak. But at the same time, I also believe that we're in a climate crisis and personally was hoping that the policy would do more to juice the market for alternative fuels um, earlier and faster than it appears likely to. Um, but all that said, um, I think that over time, the CFR is going to follow the path of other similar programs like the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, like the BC LCFS, where increasing stringency of the CI reduction requirement um, is going to provide an inexorable pull towards increasing volumes of clean fuels into the market and and credit prices that would should follow an upward tr trend as the program becomes more demanding. 
Great. And, you know, Dave, I'd, I'd love for you to pick up on, on Bora's comment about, you know, maybe the early years of, of this aren't going to be as challenging um, as they were anticipated to be even a few years ago. But nevertheless, there are going to be hiccups, bumps. Um, you know, what are you anticipating from your perspective? And then I'd love to hear from the rest of the group as well, you know, chiming in with your various experiences and, and what you're hearing. Yeah, no, I I think Boris' comments are bang on. I I um I think that the way that uh, the regulatory framework um, has been has been laid out uh, is constructive. I mean, it, it it does allow for a competitive environment for a number of alternatives to compete with each other and um and sort of prove themselves out and expand on the basis of uh, you know consumer acceptance and and adoption. And and so I I think that's uh, that's a really really positive thing. Um, you know, on, on the point of, uh, of the timeline and sort of the urgency around it, uh, you know, point well taken and, and uh, um, you know, I, I feel like it's always a difficult balance uh, to try and change things that are as, uh, as colossal as, as uh, transitioning energy. Great. Uh, Giuseppe, Ryan, any, any challenges that, that you can point to that you think will need to be overcome? For sure. Um, I mean, I'll take a perspective from public transit, maybe some examples that have, have worked recently. You know, of course, it takes time to uh, change things. So fundamentally, Rome wasn't built in a day. But those of us at the forefront of the industry are thinking, okay, it's already been a decade, like, let's get this show on the road. And those of us at the end of the industry are thinking, whoa, 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 this is way too fast. So somewhere in between Canadians will hit the happy medium. And we'll get this out the door. But to your point, Bora, um, the reality is it's already started to change the dialogue. And sometimes all that the federal government or a province has to do is give the market signal that it's coming and then consistently give that market signal. And that signal is here now. There's been more than enough discussion about the clean fuel standard. And now in terms of the strategy eventually coming out, we've already been fielding calls from companies as diverse as, of course, Enbridge is one of our partners, but Shell and loads of others, European producers of hydrogen that are coming into the landscape in Canada saying, tell us where your clientele is. And I'm saying to them, look, we don't have enough green hydrogen, so get your hydrogen here as fast as you can. And we may actually have an ability to even pay for hydrogen at a higher price point than diesel because of the amount of subsidization right now. So that alone is a market shifter. Um, it doesn't even exist yet. You can't really collect the credits, but you have everybody and their cousin from the petrochemical industry over to the green and renewable industry giving us calls asking about which agencies in transit are going to adopt this stuff and how quickly. So that might not be an automatic for shareholders saying go plunk some billions of dollars over there, but it's most certainly a different narrative from three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, where you couldn't find anybody discussing the meaningful investment into this industry, whether I'm talking about hydrogen or energy storage that's going to support the electrified landscape. Now, I'll leave CNG to the, to the other side of the equation because the dialogue there really is about renewable natural gas. Um, but it's very similar. You know, everybody is calling us now from the RNG sector saying like which transit agencies have CNG buses where we can pump some RNG into the supply chain and start getting some credits. And it's all being driven by this idea of credit creation. And the second thing I'd say, Emma, is if we take a look at similar stories that have been successful and, and failed stories that prove why they would have been successful. The carbon pricing markets of Ontario and British Columbia. So the fact that Ontario cancelled its cap and trade market, we might all remember that. But during the time that cap and trade existed and there were market signals, every cement manufacturer in town, every steel manufacturer in town was looking at how do I set up an electrolyzer? How do I do something to start capturing some of the carbon credits? And that was a very brief moment in time that that program even existed to give market signals. And you had some serious heavyweight heavy emitters picking up the phone, thinking about how do they start installing systems to produce some green fuel to get some carbon credits. That happened all within a matter of three years in a program that one could argue was discombobulated enough that it didn't get enough market or, or electoral support to actually sustain an election. That's all that it took to get those kinds of serious dialogues. Over in British Columbia, where you do have a carbon pricing market that's been in operation for quite a while, you now see not just BC Hydro as a major player investing in new renewable energies for transportation applications, but you see TransLink adopting and absorbing some of those credits in order to buy a whole bunch of electric buses. That is the market working. It took about eight years. It took about another five years of serious dialogue and three years of implementation for all the wrinkles to be ironed out as to who gets the credit, how does it pass through the market, who carries the risk, who's going to eventually get the benefit. 
but that's already happening. And those are microcosmic examples of, of what the clean fuel standard could do for Canada. So it's some indication that the policy levers work. The biggest critical element is consistency in market signaling. And the policy doesn't even have to exist for the market to start shifting. And we're already seeing that at our end, at least in the public transit domain. Emma, I just want to tag on to Yosipa's comments. Uh, I certainly agree with everything she said. I just want to put a fine point on what I'll call some level of certainty in the credit pricing. Uh, this is uh, what a lot of investors are counting on uh, in order to uh, de-risk their project to a point where it makes sense for them to invest. Uh, so there, there has to be some kind of mechanism. And I, I think if we look at California LCFS, we look at BC, there are mechanisms that exist to what I'll call bring stability and some predictability to, uh, to that credit pricing. And the, and the last thing I'll say is there has to be uh, a level playing field when it comes to uh, holding obligated parties accountable to meet their obligations. We cannot afford a lot of little uh, leaks in the dam, if you will, that uh, allow folks to skirt their obligations. Uh, and so it all has to come together. The ecosystem has to, has to all hold together holistically uh, to, to make this work for investors and uh, ultimately consumers uh, along with um, hitting those societal climate change goals. Excellent. And, you know, those are really valuable comments and, and it brings us right back to, you know, Bora, part of your role is, is um, thinking about how policies can be um, best applied or shored up. Um, so, you know, an answer to that, those, those concerns about, you know, consistency and everyone be on a level playing field and closing loopholes. Do you see any like two or three key areas where, you know, those gaps could be filled? Uh, well, uh, it's a, it's a great point. And I, I'd like to echo what Yosipa said about the importance of a consistent policy signal with respect to the CFR. I think now that the program is in place, we need to give Environment Canada uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, rather, um, as the program administrator, the space to do its work and to administer the policy. And, um, and you know, as Ryan said, the whole ecosystem needs to be there in order to support it and to participate and to ensure that they're um, doing their best to um, comply with the policy as it's been set out. Um, so I think that is really a top priority in the careful considered administration of the federal policy framework that we already have in place rather than sort of going off somewhere else and saying what other policies do we need now um arguably that you know we, this is this would take us down a separate rabbit hole but um i know that there uh, is an active debate now about what the you know appropriate policy response um of the federal government uh in terms of implementing the cap on oil and gas sector emissions um should be whether it should be the the imposition of a new uh, cap and trade system over and above the effective um, industrial carbon price that's already in place, or whether that policy could be implemented by means of the existing output based pricing system. Um, but getting back to your question, Emma, I think um, in the case of the CFR, um, one way to ensure a consistent policy signal is, is to um, administer the program in such a way that it has this intended effect of driving incremental demand relative to other policies elsewhere as best as we can tell. Um, so that means you know, assessing it relative to the um, relatively more stringent policy in BC um, and relative to other provincial renewable fuel lending mandates, uh, as well as provincial zero emission vehicle man mandates in Quebec and BC and RNG goals that are being uh, adopted in, in Quebec and, and British Columbia and perhaps elsewhere as well. Um, from an electric mobility perspective, I, I'll also offer that what I'm hoping for in the in the CFR is a um, robust additional layer in terms of supporting the business case for public and private charging um, for electric vehicles of, of all um, uh, classes, at least on road, um, and and supporting the business case for hydrogen refueling as well. Um, with the federal government uh, promising movement towards this zero emission vehicle sales mandate, I think we need to be leveraging the CFR. Um, and again, our existing policy framework to help provide the infrastructure runway 
such that these other policies, which are still being formulated, can be successful. Um, so by providing a new source, as, as others have said, um, in terms of a monetizable value for EV charging or the dispensing of hydrogen, I think the CFR has a lot of potential in that regard. Um, but aside from that, I, I really do commend the federal government. I think they're doing a great job of trying to support an accelerated adoption of, of alternative fuels and, and the infrastructure piece that goes along with that. Um, the parliamentary secretary mentioned in her opening remarks that um, there's a very sizable um, chunk of funding that was allocated uh, to the March 2022 emissions reduction plan. Um, and about 37% of that $9.1 billion by my calculations was dedicated to some form of ZEV programming. And about a quarter of that, um, or around 900 million is going specifically to charging infrastructure in suburban and remote communities, as well as to large scale urban and commercial projects through both NRCAN and the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. So we're really excited to see those, those programs um, get fully tapped. Um, but where, where I would suggest maybe, and I'll, I'll leave it here, um, where I would suggest we, we need a little bit more action um, is at the provincial level. Um, in Ontario, for example, with nearly, uh, what is it, about 40% of the Canadian population, I think the, the levels of policy support that have been provided, whether for, um, whether for electrification or for other types of liquid um, or gaseous alternative fuels, um, really pales in comparison to what the federal government has done recently. And, there's an opportunity there for, for provincial leadership that, that hasn't yet been realized in, in any of the budgetary documents that I've seen recently. Maybe, Emma, can I add a comment on this, though? Maybe, I'm going to take a different approach, uh, Bora, to a little bit of what you said, and apologize if my internet's a bit unstable, so you put up your hand, Emma, if I get choppy and robotic, but I can take a, a different approach, and, and not just in the context of, you know, I was born and raised in Alberta, now live in Ontario, and I just don't believe in EV subsidies. That's another dialogue for another day, because I do believe in get rid of cars. Um, so different dialogue for a different day, but having said that, from a regulatory standpoint, when we talk about government getting involved and, and applauding government, you know, subsidies across the board are only going to change the marketplace so much. And I think what we need to recognize is, and I don't know that we do as Canadians, just how small our government is. Like we often talk about, you know, the inflation and the bloatedness of bureaucracy, but do we realize how small our ministries of energy are? And they are tasked with an overhaul of an entire transformative market. Only really in Alberta do you have a massive ministry of energy. In the rest of the provinces, you've got basically Mickey Mouse ministries. And I don't mean that rudely to bureaucrats. I mean, it's a, it's a 20th century problem that we have designed our ministries to be set up for 20th century petroleum and natural resources, what we need to do is look at really altering the nature of our ministries responsible for transportation and energy, because we are asking a handful of bureaucrats to solve a massive problem. And that is what we've got, like out of the 10 provinces, three territories, and even throw in Natural Resources Canada in terms of the people with specialization in this field, that has only really started to grow in the last few years. You've got only, probably 100 people across the country, maybe, that are tasked with creating regulatory frameworks and subsidy programs and triggers and fuel programs to transform our entire energy landscape. So when we when we sit here and we talk about like the market signals that have to happen, yet yeah, those are very important. And then we talk about subsidies. Okay, you know we'll have a different discussion bar one day about how impactful they are at the end of the day in terms of transition. But all of these things combined are actually residing in the hands of very few people in this country within government. And so when we flag to ourselves, like, what is, how do we solve that? Therefore, there has to be in some ways less reliance uh, ultimately on government to create the policies that will ultimately transition us if they are, I'm going to say, carrot policies. And the reason I would say the carrot policies, the subsidy policies are only going to get us so far is because we're such a small economic population. There's so few tax dollars to go around. So if we are going to look to a very small group of people across our ministries of energy and transportation to solve this issue for us, and they're going to be doing it through market levers that are policy tools they have control over in the 10 provinces and federation, then probably it's going to have to be the stick policies that are going to have the most transformative impact, the ones that require the least amount of investment and the least amount of regulatory oversight in the sense of the bodies that are actually obligated to understand the industry at a deep level. And those stick policies do come down to the basic elements of yeah, carbon pricing, fuel standards that impose significant fines if you don't accommodate, 
and then road pricing, toll roads, all the stick elements that force the market as an in individual investors, the market as in municipal public transit investors, and the market as in transportation uh, owners and private fleets to shift because their profit margin is dependent on it because their profit margins being eaten up by large fees and fines. That can be generally fairly easily constructed as policy tools by a very small group of people, which is what we have to work with in this country. So I just want to put it out there because it's so common for us to look at government to solve the problem. We have to say government needs to get involved, by which we mean government should throw like money at the problem. And a handful of bureaucrats should find bazillions of dollars to subsidize us into the green future. It's not going to happen. It's not happening in this country, and it won't work efficiently. So those stick policies, which few bureaucrats can manage effectively, that force the market to consider profit margins based on penalties and fines, they do work. Um, at least they are policy levers that may work within the context that we have to operate with in this country. So I'll, I'll put that out there because, you know, we just don't have trillions of dollars to throw at an issue. We are not the largest economy in the world, and we can't run a trillion dollar debt forever and believe that we won't have a credit rating issue. Like Canada is not the United States, so we do need tools that are less about subsidy, more about regulatory fines and frameworks that force private industry to make those economic decisions, less reliance on bureaucrats to do the job for us, because there's so few of them in structures that are not designed for this problem. Great. And, and you know, Dave and Ryan, I'd love to bring you both back to the conversation, you know, from the supplier side, responding to what, you know, Giuseppe, or sorry, Giuseppe and Vora, um, you know, we're just talking about, from your perspective, what would be maybe not the carrot, maybe not the stick, but like a nice hand-holding way for us all to move forward together. You know, what are some supports at a policy level that could be valuable for, for suppliers of alternative uh, fuels? I, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think for, for, for us, you know, we're a marketing organization. We believe very, very strongly in the power of the consumer. I, I do think there's a role for consumers and, and for, uh, you know, for industry to participate in in the solution finding as well. Um, certainly, there's a role for government, but um, you know, I, I think the various uh, sort of carrots and sticks uh, need to be complemented with real world solutions that consumers find attractive. Uh, I, I think you know, a Tesla probably did as much or more for EV adoption than any carrot or stick offered by any government in the world. And and so I, I do think there's an important role for industry to to, to play. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some great minds in this industry. I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it would be, um, you know, it'd be a waste to let uh, to let one sort of uh, aspect of the economy, be it government or industry alone, um, tackle this problem. I, I think it's a big enough problem that we all got to work together. Yeah, and, and I agree with Dave. Uh, I think there is a lot of good collaboration going on between, let's call it the public and, pri and private sectors uh, to continue to develop the technologies that we need uh, to de-risk investment in the alternative fuel space and to fund the necessary capital investments. We can't forget about the capital requirements here that are just enormous um, to, again, to make these investments turn. So we need uh, those capital providers, traditional and non-traditional capital markets. Uh, I don't think relying uh, solely on, uh, on government uh, to, to help fund uh, those investments is, is prudent uh, or wise and uh, they probably lack the capability uh, to do that in an efficient way um, anyway, given the number and the amount of projects and capital that we're talking uh, about uh, just across Canada. Um, I will say I also think there does need to be clarity and policy in areas like mineral and metals mining and processing. Um, uh, certainly when you look at uh, the composition of electric uh, batteries, uh, there are real issues there uh, about how to responsibly source uh, and to trade those uh, minerals and metals, for example. We, we need, uh, you know, global trade policies that are going to facilitate and uh, not only facilitate, but ensure that there is a steady supply uh, of those uh, minerals, metals uh, that are needed. 
Uh, and then last comment is the breadth of partnerships. You know, it has to happen between ag and energy. It has to happen between pipelines and railroads, engineering, construction, uh, technology providers, distributors, all of these folks in this ecosystem all play a really important role. And along with that, we have to keep our eye on affordability for the consumer uh, and make sure that we're also educating the consumer about uh, their, their choices and the real impact of the choices that they make on climate change. Uh, because as things evolve, uh, certainly uh, those alternative fuels will change in terms of their role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, lots to think about there, uh, but, but again, relying solely on, uh, I'll call it government to, uh, to fund this transition, uh, I think is uh, not a wise uh, assumption to make. Great, well, clearly there's no such thing as a simple problem. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'd like to move us on to audience questions now because we do have some uh, great ones coming in. And, um, you know, the one that jumps out to me, it's actually a question I have on my mind a lot of the time I you know, was raised in the area of recycle, reduce, reuse. Um, you know, how much of the existing um, oil and gas or like pipeline generally infrastructure that we have can be leveraged to transport um, hydrogen or alternative fuels um you know is is there an opportunity here that we don't maybe have to build as much new stuff as as we think we might uh, yeah i'll start off this but just real quickly oh, I, yeah. I think existing infrastructure works for uh so existing natural gas pipeline infrastructure for example uh can be uh reused for hydrogen uh so that application exists there uh, so uh, that's technically feasible uh, to do that kind of thing. Um, but the reality is, is when you, again, you go into uh, alternative fuels like biofuels, ethanol, biodiesel, fame-based biodiesel, uh, the infrastructure really in many cases has to, has to be segregated or separated and it's not fungible uh, across all of the uh, all of the blend components that you put ethanol and biodiesel into. Now, renewable fuels. Again, I made the comment that that's much less of an issue. It's you can use the existing infrastructure uh, without any concerns. So, uh, again, depends on uh, the particular alternative fuel, and uh, hopefully that sheds some light on it. Great, Yusufi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I think, Brian, you capture most of it and say, you know, you, there, a lot of the pipeline can be used to transport gaseous hydrogen, it's possible. I mean, there are some technical elements around the degradation of the pipeline to consider, et cetera, but I'd go further and say that it's not enough. Like we've got some pipeline network we can certainly leverage, but when hydrogen comes out the other end, just like natural gas, got to compress it, you've got to transport it, you've got to move it that last couple kilometers to the end user, and none of that exists right now. And that is an issue. And to give you an example, you know, the hydrogen for our Mississauga bus project, which is about 10 fuel cell buses in the city of Mississauga, it's coming from Enbridge, and that's over in Markham. And just getting the hydrogen from Markham to Mississauga, which is like 50 kilometers across the highway, has been an epic two-year development effort. So you got to get it on some trucks, and those tube trailers are on diesel, and they're going to go down the highway, and they're going to get to Mississauga, and then you've got to get a kind of compression system to get it out of the truck. You've got to get it at the right pressure levels and then pump it into your buses. And that's just for 10 buses. And as a result of that system, you know, the hydrogen is four times the price of diesel. And it's not easily, yes, it's true, grow the volume, you'll scale down the price. But you have to build all of that, not just for transit and coaches, but for trucks and rail in the future. That is not solved only by leveraging our pipelines. And so, you know, to pull the wool from our eyes, we've got some pipelines we can use. But boy, do we have like a hub and spoke model that we really need to develop that is just starting like ground zero right now for the transportation landscape. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like the whole last mile theory that we have for logistics 
of you know the stuff we buy, but like also now for the the fuels we're going to use. Um, so another question that came in from the audience, and um, it's not to anyone specifically, but it is an interesting perhaps policy one. Um, you know, with the shift away from gas and diesel uh, towards either EVs or or hydrogen uh, vehicles, um, you know, we're missing a, a fuel tax. And uh, we've seen in Saskatchewan, you know, they popped a, a tax on EV drivers to, to make up for the, the difference of them not filling up at the pump and, and getting, um, you know, that extra cost on their fuel. So long story short, um, what do we think is going to happen on that when this transition happens en masse and there are a lot, a lot of tax dollars missing um, that we have now? Uh, maybe I'll add one element and then turn to the peers like I have no problem with taxing electric cars eventually and why because you've got to tax cars like there's just no way to move as many people as we're going to try and get into our cities with that many cars on the road so cars 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 are bad I mean that's just the the baseline we can't get away from that um, but the issue is the lost revenue and presumably with some good synergistic planning on the policy side the loss in gas taxes can be recuperated through the gain in carbon pricing or any carbon pricing models or any roll toll measures. I mean, it's not like there's a, a non-existent, non-infinite supply of potential places to levy taxes. There are. And that, to me, is not a full stop at all. Um, when people point to that as an absolute death, well, that's just lack of creativity and thinking about where we should be leveraging and generating some new revenue from taxpayers because it's legit, because we're trying to devalue certain activities and behaviors because they're going to kill us. You know, th that's entirely feasible and doable. And I think just to put it within the context of um, you know, when we take a look at a large city like Toronto or Montreal or British Columbia or like Vancouver, even just looking at car usage right now, even if we tax not because of the carbon, but we tax simply because we want energy security, you know, on the basis that we need to consume less overall, whether it's a petroleum fuel or it's an electric fuel, energy security and climate change means we just need to use less all the time in our houses, in our cars, on our roads, in our carbon produced products and plastic forks. We just need to use less. That creates a whole landscape of potentially electable forms of tax generation that do actually create the society we want to live in. So I, I put that out there. I don't think they were wrong to do it. Probably the messaging was not great PR, but eventually it's going to come down the pipeline. Great. Any other comments on, on making up the taxes? Well, I'll well, chime in just to go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. Uh, or, yeah, real quickly, I think, you know, the current tax on on uh, liquid fuels, it's it's a consumption tax, right? The, the more so to pay for our uh, the upkeep of our roads uh, and that system. Uh, and, uh, you know, the more you consume, the more tax you pay, which makes sense. Theoretically, you're using that those roads more. I think the interesting part will be, well, number one, I believe they will find alternative methods to of taxation uh, as electric vehicles come into play. Uh, they have to, to maintain uh, the road infrastructure, bridges, et cetera, all those funds go to. The, the interesting part is going to be, how do you measure the amount of electricity you're consuming when you're at your home for your vehicle per needs versus all the other needs that you have uh, for electricity that's uh, coming into your household. And so we do have to keep in mind that there, there, there is an equity issue here uh, in terms of taxation. And that is, uh, do I tax consumers uh, or those who use the roads more? And what method do I come up with versus those that, uh, that aren't using the roads as much? And so um, it's going to be hard to distinguish what you're consuming that electricity for if you're charging at home. I think uh, just to pick up on that was a great point, Ryan. And I think that's one of the reasons actually that the CFR like indirectly was designed in such a way that only networked charging stations will be eligible for credit creation because right. Environment Canada foresaw that there was a need brought in a broader systemic sense to ensure that all charging would be able to be metered correctly. And I think, you know, lots of folks are working on that, that challenge of sub-metering at the home. Um, but I'll just um, also add my concurrence to what others have said, and, and Sipa in particular, on 
um, the need to address the um, coming deficit in revenues on uh, road uh, maintenance um, from the gradual shift to electric cars and the light duty fleet. I think that lots of policymakers are thinking about how to how to make up the the loss in fuel taxes and um, it's entirely appropriate that that cars should have to pay some type of either registration fee or fuel associated to their um, or tax associated to their, their use of fuel in order to, to keep up that public good. Excellent. We have time for our last question, which is actually picking up on a thread that we talked about a little earlier. Um, somebody would like to know what last mile distribution network is available for renewable uh, diesel in BC and where is it located? So perhaps like a real world, world example model of something that's being done well that we could replicate. I can use our uh, eco diesel uh, launch as an example. Um, so uh, we uh, developed a couple of years ago in partnership with the city of Vancouver, um, some infrastructure to bring in uh, hydro treated renewable diesel. Um, and um, we uh, are able to, to transport it into the Vancouver market and provide it to, uh, um, to those that can take bulk uh, distribution of, um, of uh, hydro treated renewable diesel. So right now that is the sort of last mile delivery pathway uh, that, that's open. Um, and, uh, and, and so uh, we'll kind of uh, hopefully expand from there, both from a logistics perspective and in terms of um, the, the pathways to, uh, to sort of consumer facing um, uh, service offerings. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody very, very much. We are hitting the end of our time. So um, even though there are many more questions and I'm sorry to the audience, we didn't get to them all. Thank you for participating, but this has been a fabulous discussion and very much appreciate your time and wisdom. And I will hand it back to Nino. Well, uh, thank you very much, Emma, for moderating the discussion and special thanks to our panelists, Dave, Yazipa, Bora and Ryan for sharing the expertise and thank you to everyone in the audience for attending and for, for the uh, great and many questions that came through. I'm just sorry we weren't able to get to more of them. A, a big thank you once again to our presenting sponsor, Petro Canada for coming on board to uh, support this uh, series. And we will be sharing a link to a recording of this webinar in the next few days on electricautonomy.ca. The second episode in this series uh, takes place tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, um, with a new panel of speakers and a, and a different topic of conversation. So I encourage, if you haven't already registered, please visit our website to register for that. You, you are required to register for each individual webinar in this series. So thank you very much for joining us today and uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow.